So let's look in a little more detail at the equilibrium size of respiratory droplets that are emitted uh, during breathing or coughing or speaking. And the key idea is that these droplets are not pure liquid. As explained in the Wells curve, pure droplets that are small enough will shrink completely and evaporate. However, these droplets contain a significant amount of, uh, of solutes. And those solutes, uh, in the case of mucus coming from your lungs or from your vocal cords, your nasopharynx, uh, are full of proteins and other macromolecules, carbohydrates. And also, there are always in bodily fluids plenty of dissolved salts, such as sodium and chloride or calcium or potassium ions. Uh, also in saliva, and many of these species are present, although it's not quite as thick uh, of, a, of a liquid. And of course, virions as well uh, will find themselves here and are also constitute solutes. So the idea is that we don't just have a pure liquid. Um, so there is uh, some initial uh, volume fraction of solute in the liquid. And in addition to that, most of these liquids, uh, the, these, 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 these uh, sorry, the solutes, I should say, are charged and thus hygroscopic. What that means is that, of course, the salt, those ions are literally charged species, but also the proteins and other macromolecules have many charged residues and sites on the, on their, on their, uh, <clears throat> along the along the molecule, which attract water, and essentially there is a layer of bound water solvating all of these species I just mentioned, including the virus. So uh, I'll just kind of sketch that there's you know kind of you know lots of bound water, um, which is kind of surrounding each each species, including the virus. There's essentially a layer of water, mostly around these uh, molecules here and, and other species. So it's solutes plus the bound water that's coming from solvation of these molecules in liquid. So that water is pretty firmly attached. And even if you dry uh, the, the material, a lot of that water will still be left over. It takes a significant amount of energy uh, to remove it. And so if we think that the, if we describe there's initial volume of the droplet V0 and uh, a radius uh, R0, so let's say it's initially a circular droplet, there is an initial amount of solid, Vs, which is phi S0 times V0. So there's a certain amount of solutes in there which cannot be removed. So the water can evaporate, but the solutes uh, will not. So let's think a little bit about what the consequences of that are. So let me do a brief derivation here uh, for the, looking at the thermodynamics of this system. And the key idea is just to get to the final result here. I don't want to dwell on the details of thermodynamics. But an important concept here is the relative humidity of the air. So there's moisture in the air. There's water vapor. And it's at a certain level. Uh, so we often write that RH for relative humidity. And that can be defined as the concentration of vapor, water vapor in the air, relative to the vapor concentration that would be in equilibrium with pure liquid. So when the concentration of water vapor gets high enough, eventually you start to nucleate water droplets and you start to have condensation of water. That's essentially how rain forms uh, from the clouds. So, uh, that's that ratio. So relative humidity is telling you how close you are to basically having water, liquid water, come out of the air. Okay. Now, the relative humidity also tells us something about the uh, sort of how far you are from that phase trans transition point. And as a very simple approximation, I'll put approximate here, um, we can also write that this is scales with and is can be in fact close to the liquid volume fraction in equilibrium inside the drop. So that would be the water volume fraction of water liquid inside the droplet. At least you can see here in this relationship, when this volume fraction is one, in other words, we have pure water, 
then the rate of humidity is 100%, okay? And on the other hand, when you have, let's say only, you know, 50% water over here, that's like having relative humidity 50%. Where, this can be derived by more careful consideration of the ideal entropy of mixing, where essentially this term here is taking into account the excluded volume and the fact that sort of all the sites, uh, you know, in this, uh, in, this, in this droplet are not available for the water. So they're being excluded by all the solutes and the bound water that are present. And similarly, we have uh, a buildup of uh, sort of free energy um, um, in, the, in, the, in the bulk as well. So basically this comes from uh, some thermodynamic considerations of equilibrium between water vapor and water liquid. We can write this as one minus the volume fraction in equilibrium uh, of the solid, okay? Now, the thing is that uh, we can now uh, write this, so if we multiply um, through, we can write this as one minus the, uh, so, so, so what is the volume, so when we get to equilibrium, this droplet is gonna change its shape, it's gonna reach a new shape, which we're gonna calculate, our new volume, V equilibrium. And so what this would be, it would be V solid, which is phi S zero V zero, divided by V equilibrium. So it's gonna be a new volume V equilibrium, uh, which will be, you know, achieve then, and then we'll end up with the equilibrium volume fraction. So if I take these equations here and I solve, I get a fundamental result, which is that uh, the equilibrium volume of the droplet relative to the initial volume is equal to, well, we have uh, put this on the other side, then we have one minus RH, and we divide that out, and we find that it's the initial volume fraction of solutes divided by one minus RH. That is our key result. And let's plot what this looks like. So, uh, so if we plot the relative humidity on the horizontal axis from zero to 100%, so at 100%, the water vapor is saturating the air and you would start to nucleate and condensed water liquid from that. At zero, the air is completely dry and there is essentially no water vapor present. So that's the range. And typical comfortable rooms have a relative humidity around 50% is a, a typical number. And let's plot on this axis the, vo the equilibrium uh, volume. It could also be the equilibrium radius, because I should say, that if there's spheres, that this is also equal to R equilibrium divided by R zero cube. So I can also take a cube root of this and I would have the ratio of radii. So we would know if we started at a certain radius, what's the final radius, okay? So we can talk about volume, we can talk about radius. So here is the initial size of the drop. And somewhere down here is Vs, which is the solute volume which is phi S zero times V zero. Now, what is this value? It depends on the kind of liquid. So saliva is mostly water with some salt and a few other molecules. Uh, but in saliva, the uh, volume fraction uh, phi S zero is 0.5% uh, uh, in saliva. Okay, so that's just gives you a sense. So this is quite far down, right? But then if you look in mucus, it depends which mucus you're talking about, but the mucus that comes from the lungs or from, from the pharynx, it can vary. But what has also been measured in droplets that are emitted by breathing is that this can range anywhere from five to 10%. So a fairly significant amount of the volume of the droplet is containing all these molecules and the bound water around that. Now we know that because mucus is very sticky. It's a non-Newtonian fluid. It, it doesn't maintain a nice round shape even. It can kind of have an irregular shape. It flows slowly. It has a high viscosity. Uh, and that's because it has a large amount of these uh, hygroscopic uh, solutes. So mucus might be a little bit higher up. But in any case, what you then find is uh, we can sketch different regions of this plot now. So this curve, this, this formula I derived here, when the relative humidity is zero, we start here. 
So that's saying when there's no water in the air, you completely dry the droplet and you're left just with the molecules, the solute molecules, and possibly the bound water around it, depending on how dry the air actually is. And then it rises up like, and blows up at 100%. So when you get to 100%, then droplets are getting really large. Okay? And if you actually hit 100%, then you can't really speak of an equilibrium size because you'll just start to get lots and lots of water. Um, so that's, that's that limit. And so now we can look at sort of three different regimes uh, of the kinds of droplets that we'd expect to see. So down here at 0% or close to 0, we have uh, sort of dried droplet nuclei, as they're called in the public health field. Uh, these respiratory aerosols, if they completely dry out and you're left with just these solutes, then that's called a droplet nucleus. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's a nucleus for phase transformation as we use that term in, say, engineering or in, in physics, but it's really just sort of refers to the core of just the sort of hydrated solutes. So if I could sketch what that looks like, um, that would be, uh, for example, all those molecules I just sketched there, you know, might be kind of condensed into some little blob, which, by the way, could include a virion. In fact, it could even be just one virion if that were all that were in, the, in, this, in there. And you would have a little bit of bound water around it, but you essentially have a dried up kind of blob of just the solutes, okay? And so that, and then of course the smallest volume you can get is just the, sol the initial solute volume that you started with, so plus the bound water. On the other end, uh, if we are near 100% relative humidity, then the fact that these are hygroscopic solutes which like to have water near them will form as a nucleation site to actually cause more and more water to grow and be absorbed into this droplet and not only do the droplets not shrink as predicted by the wells curve for a pure liquid but they can actually grow so if the size here is small enough to begin with let's say it were a you know several micron droplet to begin with but it contains a lot of solutes and we're at very high humidity actually the particle can grow so over here, we could end up with an even larger droplet than we started with, where now, because the humidity is so high, and we have the same number of molecules in there that I sketched before, but it's more dilute now. And there's maybe a virus or a virion here and there, and there's, of course there's also some salt. But basically the droplet is growing. So here we have... Uh, hygroscopic growth. And also we have what's called deliquiescence, which refers to water that's absorbing around these salt molecules and even causing some other molecules or charges on these macromolecules to dissolve into solution because there's more and more water present and it can solvate more species. And so Whereas hygroscopic growth refers to water being absorbed sort of into a more solid-like framework, you can also be generating more aqueous solution, which is deliquescence. So basically the droplet can actually grow, and that would be sort of like when you're here, let's just say, and this might be when you're you know, here. And then of course when you're at 50% relative humidity, you can see the droplet has shrunken, but not all the way down to the initial solute volume fraction, but something larger. And in fact, if the relative humidity is 50%, you end up at exactly twice the solid volume fraction. <laughs> so, uh, so if the solid volume fraction of mucus is 10%, you may end up with a droplet uh, that is maybe 20% of the volume. So maybe it looks you know, something like this. Okay, and so we have a little bit of shrinking going on. And maybe there's even a virus in there as well. Uh, but there is still plenty of water. And so you can see also now the value of having solutes in mucus in terms of making the virions more viable and more easily transmittable because they hold onto the water so that the virion is in a sort of stable environment so that when it ends up uh, being inhaled into someone else's lungs that it can then more easily sort of diffuse out of that, that region and uh, infect the host cells. In contrast, if you have a nearly pure liquid that the virion is in, let's say pure water or even saliva, which is actually mostly water, then the droplet will shrink by a factor of 100 
And it might be just literally a, a virion with a couple salt molecules, a couple ions kind of just enveloped with a tiny bit of water. And maybe, and that I, uh, in, in some cases would be not as viable uh, of a uh, situation for the virion. So basically the mucus fragments are likely to be the more uh, common source of the aerosols that will stay in the air and remain infectious.